the intuitive machine's lander Odysseus is asleep on the lunar surface. Hi, and welcome to Ad Astra. I'm Swapna Krishna. Let's talk about the last few days of getting some cool pictures of Odysseus finally on the lunar surface, what's been going on with Odysseus, as well as what we found out from intuitive machines about the mission, and then break down whether I think it was a success. The press conference with Intuitive Machines and NASA on Wednesday had a very self-congratulatory tone. The question is, was it earned? We'll get to that a little later, but let's start with the little lander that could. Odysseus is no longer receiving power to its solar cells. But instead of letting the lander quietly run out of battery and go gently into the good night, Intuitive Machines actually preemptively shut it down before that point. That way they have some hope of reviving Odysseus in three or so weeks when the sun's shining on the solar panels again. They pulled this image from Odysseus and published it before the lander went dark. Tim Crane, the chief technology officer of Intuitive Machines, says that the batteries aren't tested for that deep cold. I think the number they were throwing around in terms of temperature was negative 250 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 156 degrees Celsius, but in the South Pole region of the moon, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has measured temperatures as cold as negative 410 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 246 degrees Celsius. For more on the moon's extreme temperatures, check out my video. Basically, the battery chemistry is not gonna respond well to that deep cold. They are relatively confident that the solar panels will be fine, but if the batteries don't last and aren't there to receive power, then it's game over. It's worth noting that the flight computers and the radios also are not tested to withstand that kind of cold. But then again, Japan's moon lander Slim also wasn't expected to survive the lunar night, and it's woken up twice now, so fingers crossed that Odysseus does make it. But let's move on to the fun stuff, the photos. Here is what we got from Intuitive Machines. There are a few really interesting things in these photos. Let's start with this one. This picture was taken in the final stages of descent as Odysseus is coming down onto the moon's surface. I know this isn't the best quality, but I think this is actually an awesome photo. You can see the engine here, and this is where the plume of the Methalox engine is reacting with the lunar regolith. We can also see Odysseus' broken leg. We have a better idea now of what happened during landing, thanks to the press conference this week. If you need a rundown of the earlier issues with the laser rangefinders and someone forgetting to disable a safety switch, check out my previous video. Basically, because of a software issue with the navigation algorithm that they missed when creating the patch for Odysseus to use NASA's LiDAR system, Odysseus was only using its optical navigation instruments and IMU, or inertial measurement unit, during landing. It did not have altimeter data. When Odysseus came in for a landing, it was 1.5 kilometers away from its target landing site at a higher elevation than expected. That's why it came down so fast. Expected was about one meter per second or two miles an hour. Actual was six meters per second or 13.5 miles per hour. The landing gear absorbed that impact and the spacecraft sort of skidded across the lunar surface. Because of that, it broke one, maybe two of its legs. The spacecraft did land vertically. It's important to note that. And then after the engine shut off, it gently leaned over at about a 30 degree angle. It did not fall violently. Remember, the moon has about a sixth of the gravity of Earth. It was upright for about two seconds on the lunar surface. The International Lunar Observatory also released some photos from their camera on the lunar surface. This is a wide field image. It was during descent and really reveals the local terrain of the lunar surface around the landing area. But that is also the camera that is supposed to be oriented into space to take pictures of the center of our galaxy from the moon's surface. Unfortunately, it looks like that camera is not oriented towards the center of the galaxy, so that is kind of a bummer. I was looking forward to those really cool space shots. Here's another shot from the International Lunar Observatory's Wide Field Imager. It looks too blown out to see anything, except I did some really rough editing in Lightroom, and there is more in here than you think. Here's the lander on the left, and on the lunar surface, here is a piece of the lander's broken leg. This is another photo of the spacecraft on the lunar surface. You can see the leg here is not making contact with the surface because it's tilted at about 30 degrees. In this picture, the sun is on the right side of the image, and this dark spot here is a crater. 
If you want to orient yourself as to where Odysseus is on the lunar surface, if you look at the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter image of the spacecraft, this crater over here is the same dark crater as in the image. This was definitely a cool set of pictures to go through. I really enjoyed them. We also got a ton of information on the communications issues with the lander. I talked earlier about my theories that Intuitive Machines was struggling with communications for various reasons. If you want to see more on that, watch my video. It turns out I was right. The first few days, apparently they really had trouble establishing stable communication through their private lunar data network and had to ask NASA for assistance. Once they got things sorted, Intuitive Machines was able to reliably download data, but that's why it took so long to get information and photos. They had to work with NASA's Deep Space Network to figure out where the lander was and improve communications. You might remember I talked about the orientation of the antennas on the lander. The high gain antenna at the top of the spacecraft was supposed to do the bulk of communicating with Earth. But because of how things ended up oriented, Intuitive Machines ended up using one of the four small antennas to transmit the bulk of the data to the largest dish in their private communications network. That is located in Australia. They have had about eight hours a day of pulling as much data off the lander as they can when the positioning is optimal for that dish. Apparently, because of the orientation of the antennas, they were also receiving two signals from Odysseus, the straight signal from the lander, as well as the opposite polarization from the signals coming off the lander and then bouncing off the lunar surface and coming to Earth. They had to work with NASA and the Deep Space Network to clean that up. As of the press conference Wednesday, the team had downloaded over 350 megabytes of data, and the lander didn't go dark until yesterday, so they probably got significantly more. That included most of the guidance and control data, all of the propulsion and performance data, and a lot for the NASA and private experiments as well. Okay, so now let's talk about the overall mission. Was it a success? Intuitive Machines and NASA have both declared it a success, but it's also definitely in their interest to do so. Intuitive Machines, because they're a private company, and they want to make money on doing these kinds of missions for commercial partners as well as NASA. NASA, because the Artemis program has been kind of a mess with delays everywhere. This was a win they needed, especially after the announcement that earlier this year, the next crewed missions would be delayed, which frankly we all knew, but you never want that headline if you're running the program. This is a big win, but is it spin or is it actually a win? People will probably argue about this for a long time, but my opinion is, yeah, it's a win. It was a successful mission. Was it an unmitigated success? No, there were absolutely failures along the way. Tim Crane did directly address the laser rangefinder issue and confirmed that if the system had been operational, they would have made a pinpoint landing in the Malapert A crater and the system would have been able to compensate for any change in elevation. If we would have had the laser rangefinders, we would have nailed the landing. That is confirmation that if they hadn't missed that safety switch on the laser rangefinders, the lander likely would not have fallen over. But what was the point of the mission, and does the lander tipping over mean that it was unsuccessful? I would say no. The mission objective was simply a demonstration of the hardware. Can you get to the moon? Can you soft land on the moon? Can you send data back from the moon? The answer to all of those things is yes, even if none of them happened perfectly. There's absolutely room for improvement, but the expectations here were pretty basic, and I think Intuitive Machines did achieve them. I'm not making excuses for the company. This is how spacecraft testing works. In fact, I think they did a pretty good job troubleshooting issues in real time as they came up. The team acknowledged that they could have done better communicating with the public along the way, which I personally would have appreciated. But also, I understand it's a small team that was very focused on doing this job. We found out later about a few critical issues that could have ended the mission early. Apparently, the liquid methane fuel wasn't cooling properly at a few points. There was a serious star tracker issue where the star tracker was rejecting data and they had to send up a patch to fix it. Of course, we knew about the laser rangefinder issue. If I never say the word laser rangefinders again, it will be too soon. Communications issues as well, which we have discussed, learning to chill the metal of the engine, drift in the yaw channel of the main engine control, too low of an orbit after lunar orbit insertion. So lots of issues to work through and learn from, but they did work through them. Tim Crane said that there were 11 mission critical issues they had to work through over the course of the mission, 
but that's how spaceflight works, especially on demonstration missions. I think it's important to give credit where it's due, and space is hard. Here's what I think they did really well. I am impressed with the communication. Even if we weren't getting a lot for a while there, it is a private company. They don't necessarily have to share a lot of this, and I didn't expect that much. I appreciate how frank they have been about their mistakes and failures. I think it sets a great precedent for commercial space flight going forward. I do think it's nice that Intuitive Machines committed to sharing their learnings with other private companies trying lunar missions. It would be great, and I hope they do this. That's how it should work. But also, I am realistic about the fact that this is a private company, and so I'd love for that to happen, but I'll also have to see them actually do this to believe it versus them just saying the thing that sounds nice. The bottom line is over half of all lunar landing attempts over the course of history have ended in failure, and Intuitive Machines did beat the odds here. I think it is a successful mission. So what's next? Well, in three or so weeks, Intuitive Machines will try to wake Odysseus up, and I'll definitely be following that. We still have photos and data to see from a bunch of the instruments, and I'll make sure anything interesting is in my weekly Space News Roundup, which if you haven't watched those, I give you the highlights of Space News every Thursday. Intuitive Machines has two more lunar landings as part of NASA's CLIPS initiative, as well as a commercial landing on the books. They're also developing a larger lander they call the Nova D lander. Tim Crane did say that the next mission will have better cameras that they heard us loud and clear about the bad cameras, so I'm excited about that. And in the meantime, we will see what happens next. Thank you for watching. I am Swapna Krishna, and this is Ad Astra.